I don't think that the genre defines the music is just like a branch off of the tree that is the source of music. Um, but like this tree, it has many branches and many leaves and many aspects of it. It's got its roots and its trunk and it really all flows into the same river. It's like how a river has many tributaries. Like it'll break off, but it all comes back to the source. And so if people could pull that together, they would never say something like, oh, I love all music, but I hate country. Cause you can't love all music and hate country. My name is Michael Pino. I'm from Arlington, Virginia. What's up? I'm Brandon. Uh, my name is Kid Plastic. Hi, I'm Marissa. I'm Carlina Martin. I'm 25 years old. Um, part time, I like to write my own songs on the side while also serving at a church. I play drums, um, I sing, just released a new single. So, yeah, some pretty exciting stuff going on. So, I create live visuals for bands and DJs and for myself, and I use this program called Module 8 which is essentially a video mixing program. It's similar to a DJ program or an audio mixing program, but instead of audio, you have visuals that you can layer on top of each other, blend them, add effects, et cetera, et cetera. And then in my case, I'm able to siphon that from modulate into this other program called Mad Mapper to create shapes and layers and all of that kind of thing. I also use this program called Ape, which I believe is audio pixel editor which allows the music that I'm listening to to control the visuals. So I'll be listening to techno and tuning it up with module 8 and it'll make the, the visuals hit on the beat. Uh, I like to think that I make some blues, jazz, uh, hip-hop and R&B fusion type stuff. Um, I wouldn't really say that I have a specific genre but there's a fair amount of sounds that I make. So, um, so this is called What You Doing and it's uh pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> at a church. I'm a worship leader and I also play the keys and that is something that takes up a lot of my time but it's really awesome and I absolutely love doing it. I've been I've been in the music since I can remember. It's something really special to me. It correlates with the visuals and it just takes me to a different place. It's a way to escape from the day-to-day -day existence and it's a way to change yourself. Really, I feel like music has a lot of power. But um, I'm into all kinds of music. I grew up with mainly gospel and spurred into other forms of music. Um, singing was a main hobby for me, but again, kind of spun into other things. Music. It makes me feel different ways depending on what I'm listening to. Some music makes me feel elated and free and at one with the earth, the world. Other music makes me feel dark, it makes me feel down, makes me feel depressed. And people would say, well, you gotta be, you gotta be bigger than that and stronger than that, have a mind over it. And I'm like, no, you don't control the music. The music controls you. And so, hey, it's made to have that effect. And so you can't be stronger than it. 
you just have to step step away from it if you're not able to overcome that that ideal and and then replenish it i think with something that's is positive and uplifting and joyful and and resurrecting because you know we need our spirit to be revived from its sunkenness so what music means to me it's very therapeutic honestly um you know Usually when I'm sad, I do the opposite of what other people do. I'll put my happy playlist on, and when I'm in a great mood, I'll put my moody playlist on because I know it won't emotionally drag me down. Um, but when it comes to my writing, I very much pour into how I'm feeling at the moment, and that very much helps me relax, calms my anxiety, helps me get refocused. So, yeah. For me, when I've, I, I connect with the frequencies and the vibration for music. There's certain frequencies that I've really tuned into lately that really just take me to a different place. It's an instant escape from the day, my day-to-day -day existence. It's almost instantaneously. There's certain notes you hear and it's just... Whoa. It's hard for me to express my emotions with my words. Um, and a really awesome thing that I love to do uh, for that is listen to music. Um, the fact that you can find a song that really matches your emotion and listen to it and feel that or even find a song that doesn't match your emotion to change it and hopefully make yourself feel better is really awesome so yeah <laughs> it's almost it's a frequency it's like the the vibration that i want to live my life on almost it's like up here the holy hive that i was playing a minute ago you play a clip of their music and it's it's up there. It's like, ooh, okay. I'm a, you know, it's not oh, I'm depressed and sad. And there's a part for that. That's another reason I love music. I was playing. I was listening to Beck earlier when I was driving around, and thinking about mutations and thinking about all the different stuff that he's done. He's going through a happy time in his life, married, blah blah blah, and he makes this awesome, loud, beautiful record that everybody loves in Odalay. And then a couple years later, he's going through a divorce. And he switches it up and comes out with this heavy soul acoustic Bob Dylan type jam, you know? And there's that's incredible to me. I love being able to follow musicians and see them go through that transformation. <laughs> so if you couldn't tell already, we are sisters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are five years apart, but recently have become really, really close. Yes. Um, relationship wise at yeah. least but yeah so I would say a big contributor to that would be music has mm -hmm. brought us together because she just recently started playing piano at church and everything and so we've had a lot of more opportunities to serve together yeah. which means a lot more time together right. um, she's helped me a lot with my own music actually to mm -hmm. writing doing melodies figuring out harmonies all that good stuff so um, yeah. but what's funny about that is because she's five years older than me when I was younger and she was this really awesome musician. Um, I was like, I wanna be a good singer. I wanna be able to play piano. So she's actually the one that taught me how to play piano and taught me how to sing harmonies. And now that I'm more of a developed musician, continues to help me. She's better than um, me. <laughs> no, <laughs> continues to help me um, get my musicianship to be a lot stronger so so it's just a way to communicate across all um all it it breaks all language barriers so it's a great communication tool and uh it helps to serve as a vessel for your thoughts and feelings and emotions and reasoning in some aspects. So. It's a way for me to broaden my views of the world and to broaden my views of society. It also feels like in this day and age, it has the power to lead rebellion. It has the power to unite in a progressive way that the world needs right now. Um, music kind of created the The example that of how to be confident and how to be create creative and courageous in your spirit I, I'm trying not to give it too much because it's nothing without 
the source of the energy. So make no mistake, it's not just happening on its own. It needs it needs something to push it, push it to it, you know, the point of like of being heard and and perceived to listen to. So what's that source? Um well for me I would have to say that it's probably um different from what other people would say, but I would say it's God the creator. I was little and this all started with music since we were talking about it because I would make up gospel songs and my aunt who was at in the world who was raising me at the time she would not she would wonder where i got these songs from I'm trying to keep my brothers and sisters out of the county and city state and federal courts we live without resources so the money comes second to your support and effort come home to the roach motel where it smells of pesticides Insecticide and homicide, knowing that one day we'll all die inside. Dang, some of this stuff is really kind of dark. So my new single is called Lie to Me. Um, it's released on all the platforms under Carlina Martin, but the story behind it is near and dear to my heart. Um, I got out of a really intense domestic violence relationship about a year ago, and I thought, hey, maybe instead of ruining my life because of the situation, which was very scary. Um, why don't I turn the yuck and, and use it for something creative that may help others. So um, this song and the upcoming songs represent a story based on knowing signs about when you're in a toxic relationship and maybe you'll light flick and go, oh, this is a bad situation. And um, the upcoming songs also talk about how the story kind of unfolded and started becoming lightful. Delightful. <laughs> Happy. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the story behind Lie to Me. Um, it's currently out now, and yeah, I hope it can help somebody. Boy, the seasons change. Life got real. Especially right now, I, I would say that music kind of means everything to me. Um, I was raised uh, by artists and musicians, and I think that that influenced everything about the way that I approach my creative process. Um, it started with, uh, you know, creatively I think I started with drawing, but music has always been a constant in my life. My dad taught me how to sing, he taught me how to grab har harmonies and listen to a song, and music means expression and uh, a love for myself and um, also a love for what is humanity and what is nature and everything that we exist in. In summation, I would say that music means me, you know, um, when I think of what I want to do and what I want to push for in life and how I want to approach things, I think of music first. Me, this is actually something I've been thinking about a lot lately, and a lot in the last few years, to be human. And I think to be human is to be. To be human is to be present, and to be free, and to be not let things catch you, and just to be present, and find that place where you can just be steady all the time. I can tell you for myself, in the last few years, I've been through so many bumps up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. I don't know that there's one definition for all humans. So I guess what it means to be a human is to be given uh, a gift. So what I will say is to be a human is to thrive off of the welfare system of the universe. 
like it's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> um, I think to be human is to be, for myself, to be most in contact with. It's a nice trip. But um, to be most in contact and in connection with my uh, capacity to be empathetic and to feel for other people instead of feeling. Um, trying to feel exactly what they're feeling. I think that that's kind of a, a consistent, you know, point of contention in most people is when you wanna when you wanna help somebody, we make the mistake of trying to feel exactly what they're feeling. But the fact of the matter is, is that we can't because we're not them and we're not in their position. So I think to be human is to accept that and to be open and you know compassionate and ready to, to feel and uh, sorry, ready, be ready to feel for other people, to be consistent in your expression of empathy for yourself first because you can't, you know, you can't care for other people if you don't first care for yourself. And, you know, I don't think, I don't think outside of that there's much more that, go, that goes into being what epitomizes a human, you know, because what separates us from, apparently what separates us from, you know, a wild animal or your domesticated dog is the fact that we can think normatively and we can think outside of the perpetual box that we all sit inside of. So I think being human is acknowledging those things and acknowledging other human beings as, you know, people in the same situation. So. Well, for me, um, I have a very very close relationship with Jesus, God. Um, I hate making mistakes. And so I'm like, hey, instead of making a mistake and or doing all these things I know I shouldn't be doing because of bad repercussions, like if I consult with God, he can help me through it. And to be honest, um, if it wasn't for God, I would feel absolutely lost in this world. Um, so in a weird spiritual way, it's my human, um, is through God. I don't know how to describe it other than we're living in the spiritual, but in the physical, um, to me, it's really spiritual based. So, um, what that means to me is on a more practical level, um, really just, you know, waking up and doing what I have to do, what, whether that means going to work or going to school, um, but more importantly to me on a more spiritual level is living my life for the glory of God. Um, and for me, my relationship with Jesus is something that really does mean a lot to me. Know that being a human is not, being a human on this earth is not my final destination. And that I know that there's something better out there for me, which is heaven, um, eternal life in heaven. And so even though being a human is what we have to experience now, um, I know that God has something better in store for me, so, yeah. I think we're all capable of way more than we ever give ourselves credit for. Way, 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 way more. Like one example of that, my mom, she's retired, she's 75 now, I think. She picked up painting five or six years ago. She was in calligraphy when she was younger, didn't really do any of it. Her, most of her whole life, 70s, started painting. She's, it's amazing. It looks like she's been painting for 40 years, the stuff that she's doing now, you know? Untapped talent. My wife, been recovering from endometriosis for the last four or five years, going through all these surgeries, all this different stuff, just coming back up now. I see the potential in her. I see she could, she could run the world. Hello, my name is David Bashwinner, and I teach music at the University of New Mexico. I'm a guess, associate professor. I teach music theory. Are you able to give me a, um, an opposite? Is it like opposed to being an animal of a different species? Or opposed to being an inanimate object? Or as opposed to being, you know, like a good, responsible, loving human being as opposed to bad and selfish? Or what is it that is like different about being alive than being dead that isn't just like your heartbeat and you're sucking up oxygen? Yeah, um, 
with your personal life, being human, what does that mean to you? One of the main interests for me is in, uh, like, the feelings that you get from music and like certain musical tools, like thinking of the tools as being formulas or algorithms or machines, and then the emotions as being this complex mysterious response that like there's no really good reason why some machine of sound combinations should give rise to like feelings of like nostalgia, beauty, and love of whoever's singing. Um, so I get to try to make sense of some of that stuff by looking at biology. Uh, so like what's emotion? Um, what is it? What happens biologically when we do you listen to sounds and listen to music and what's going on biologically when we actively pay attention to music versus versus not actively paying attention to it because when you watch a film you don't have to pay any active attention to musical stuff at all for that music to affect how you're watching that film so I think like a very 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 big and important portion of what goes on when you're listening to music is has nothing to do with not just your conscious mind but doesn't even have to do with you're paying attention to it or not right there's like automatic effects and those effects are so big that they influence how you process meaning in a film what you think of these certain characters what you think of their relationship um, so there's this fish i like looking at called the midshipman it sings like one one tone it goes mm, uh for a long time it has these two other sounds it makes, but that's like the courtship call and like if a female's in the right reproductive stage, she's interested in it and swims by and she might decide to lay her eggs in his nest. So, um, the music there is obviously very simple. Um, and there's so many studies of the brain of the midshipman and then you also have the brain of the zebra fish. So like there's like certain fishes there or certain animals across the kingdom that are, um, like model animals that scientists try to figure out basically everything about. So by looking at zebrafish for anything that isn't known in midshipmen and for looking at midshipmen for anything that isn't known in humans and you know specifically looking at the things that are similar in how we process sound emotionally and how a fish does, you can learn about that question for humans in a way that you in a way that, that you can't do if you just ask a human, or if you like, a human is too complex of a system because we have learning and culture and attitudes. And so if you ask a human why, why they're listening to a certain song or why they feel a certain way, like they might say, oh, it's because uh, when I was growing up, I listened to this, or I associate this singer with this person in my life. And basically with a fish, we don't ask those questions and also they wouldn't be able to answer them. And none of us think that a fish is attracted to a certain sound just because of its culture. So you can at least get at the part of human being, the, the part of what it is to be human and feel something for music. You can get at that by looking at say, like the Venn diagram of human responses to sound, the this midshipman fish response to this particular sound, get into the biology of that, see how that biology maps onto our biology um, because if you go back in time our shared ancestor had you know lots of these same regions like it has a hypothalamus it has um, the whole auditory system that we have so being human then or being a human being for me the way at least i'm curious about it right now is to find the aspects of human being that are <laughs> not specifically human. What does music mean to you? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, it always means different things, definitely. So whenever, whenever I notice that I'm not interested in something specifically, like if I'm not passionate about some new thing, then I just find some way to get passionate, like I find someone to take lessons with. Um, or I try to do something that's not musical and then it usually brings me back again and if I ever get totally bored of music I'll just quit that but 
So I would say, not just is it changing all the time, but like, I'm kind of trying to make sure I'm always riding a wave of something that I don't understand, that I, that I can stay interested in. And then it's just like when you completely lose that wave, then you just gotta like do stuff to find the next wave. So when I was, I don't know, when I was really young, I just had to practice instruments. Then around puberty time, I just started getting, you know, like I, I, it's weird because I all the instruments I played before that point were single line instruments. I played the cello and then the clarinet and the saxophone and then, uh, I don't know, I felt like I wasn't, like I should probably like not learn any more instruments, but I had this feeling where I needed to play more than one note at a time. So I remember telling my mom, you know, I felt like really bad about it, but I was like, mom, I think I have to get a, a guitar or something like that because I need to be able to think in two sounds at a time. Thank you. So, and then, and I had actually secretly been like borrowing my friend's mom's guitar for a while before that to like sort of prove that I was really into it. And then she wasn't mad. You know, I was like terrified that she was gonna be like, no more <laughs> instruments. Um, so there's that, then all I wanted to do was write songs, and I would read music theory books and try to learn just like the, what I thought of as like the tricks. And like on the Dudley Do Right cartoon stuff where there's like um, the damsel in distress and she's on the train tracks so and she's tied to them. And then as the train's approaching, it's all like, you know, at some point I just realized like that's a diminished seventh chord that, that just like runs up like every three semitones and you just take a diminished chord formation and go up three. And then, yeah, anyway, you make a string like that. And that, that like creates that suspense. So like, I was thinking of it in terms of there are all these tricks that do certain things like to your emotions. Like they obviously connect with culture that you're raised in. But I think there's also like some more basic stuff that the composers figured out some of that stuff over time. So even like doing a major chord, but having a, a sharp, fourth in it that's going to resolve to the third so so if you set that up and then you bring in like that it's just like this really specific sound that composers use it in film music and stuff like that but yeah i don't think that you know i think that there's like i think composers discovered that and then it ends up being used a lot in those particular film scenes i don't think it's the other way around so I was just always wanting to learn the tricks. Um, and then at some point I stopped wanting to compose music as the main thing. I just got more into like studying the tricks. So that's like what theory is. But most music theorists are composers in some sense and most composers are music theorists. So it's, I think of it as the same faculty. But I do tend to, I tend to separate what I do and in my job at the university as like, I do theory and I don't do composition because it allows me to just have some uh, boundaries about what kinds of things I'm responsible for being intellectually aware of. Do you talk about these things with uh, your students or um, maybe, uh, this is the wrong question, but like, what are some misconceptions that people have towards music that you try to hmm. correct in your class? Hmm. You know, did culture just give us music or is it in our, we biologically, you know, we innately born to pay attention to music and want to make sound and want to make musical type sounds as opposed to like speech type sounds. <laughs> I want to make music with the people that I care about. If there's anybody in my life that I care about, I want to make music with them because I think of music as being something that is like beautiful for relationships. And then if there's anyone that I play music with, I want to play music with people that I care about and I want to, you know, want to have relationships with people that I play music with that are, you know, because of the music as opposed to um, just looking around for people who have the best fingers and can play the fastest and know the most notes. So that is, I know it's kind of like roundabout, but that's one of the things that I think is really important to 
for me to convey to students. I don't know that I ever say it in exactly that way, but um, I try to give them a, 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 a super broad understanding of, you know, we're like, I have to teach my students right now recently, like what scales are. Um, and like, all the book says is, you know, you look up the scale section, it says these are the four scales that we used in, in Western European music. Um, and I don't know, I guess I just like saying, what's a scale? <laughs> Why does it exist? If you didn't have any instruments and you just had people singing, would there be a such thing as scales or would people sing like, um, you know, they just make up new notes all the time. Uh, vice versa, can you listen to like um, things that people sing and then create scales for them? If they have, if you have an instrument like the piano, you, or no, let's not say piano, let's say like harp that's going to have seven notes per octave, like those, are, that's the scale built into it. So you can look at some instruments and find the scale. But then you're like, oh, did they get, did they sing the notes that are on the instrument or did they create the instrument to mimic the notes that they were already singing? Um, and then how often do you change, do you get to change the notes within the scale? Like scales suggest that it's always just you know, one thing up and down, but those scale degrees are um, manipulable. And then if you're, if you just say, okay, the scale is a collection of notes from here to here, then you might have given a definition of what we call scales, but you might have missed a, missed exploring, like, why do we even, what, what is the scale, like, what, how does that work in our heads? If you teach someone a scale, what does that allow them to do? What is it a scale allow me to do that I want to teach you? It might not be that thing that is like, it's these notes. No, 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 no. Um, so those sorts of things uh, to to like just by getting a little bit outside of what the vocabulary elements are and getting people to um, think about them more broadly. At first, ideally, have appreciation for other musical styles. They just see like what's going on in Western music as just one solution um, to a complex problem, and then hopefully, like yeah, build some curiosity about that with like you know so that they don't just think that other musics are equally valid, but they're like super curious to go check out what they do in those other styles and like feel ready to go explore them themselves. Mm -hmm.